Hello, good evening. My name is Michael Frederick. I'm the executive director of the Thoreau Society. I join you tonight from Thoreau Farm in the birth room of Henry David Thoreau. Welcome to our webinar weekend and featured films. There is more day to dawn, a global conversation celebrating Thoreau's lasting legacy, sponsored by the Thoreau Society. And I hope you've all had a chance to view the film, The Penobscot, which we'll be discussing tonight in this session. It's sponsored by both the Thoreau Society and Penobscot Nation, with myself, Ron Hogue, the president of the Thoreau Society. And we're joined with Jason Pardilla, James Eric Francis Sr., Jennifer Neptune, and Jay Brian Wenzel. Jason Pardilla is a carpenter by trade, but has spent his adult life as a guide on Maine rivers. Jason is a key guide and Maine carpenter for cultural tourism on Sugar Island in the Penobscot River. Jason was one of the Thoreauic Eight who paddled the entire 16-day reenactment of Thoreau's 1857 journey conducted in the spring of 2014. We're also joined by Jennifer Neptune, a registered Maine guide specializing in Native American medicinal plants. She is a master basket weaver and former director of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. Jennifer is also a master bead work artist and recreated the Penobscot Nation Chief's traditional collar, cup, and headdress. Jennifer is also the curator of the Penobscot Nation Museum. Finally, we're joined with James Eric Francis. James is the director of the Penobscot Nation Cultural and Historic Preservation Department. He is an accomplished photographer, graphic artist, filmmaker, and painter. So welcome all. The Thoreau Society is honored to host the Penobscot Nation this evening for our first webinar together. Um, Ron, maybe you'd like to say some more about the Thoreau Society's work with uh, the Penobscot Nation. Um, yeah, and in order to do that, I'm going to read, it won't take to just but a few minutes, uh, part of a column that appeared in the spring 2019 issue of Thoreau Society Bulletin. And the title of that column was Thoreau Society Welcomes Penobscot Nation. In May 2014, Penobscots, Thoreauvians, and others took part in a 16-day journey commemorating the sesquicentennial of Thoreau's book, The Maine Woods, published in 1864. This trip was featured on CBS Sunday morning and in an expansive Yankee Magazine cover story. A year later, historian James Francis Hunter Charlie Brown, and material culture expert Chris Sokalexis, all members of Penobscot Nation, gave well-received presentations at the Society's July annual gathering in Concord. To honor the thorough Penobscot connection in Henry's time and ours, we are delighted to welcome the Penobscot Nation as a group member of the Thoreau Society joining some 1,200 individual members in all 50 states and more than 20 countries. We are especially pleased to name James Francis an honorary advisor to the society, joining eminent biologist E.O. Wilson and distinguished nature writer and ecologist Terry Tempest Williams. With his advisor appointment comes an opportunity to advance the thorough Penobscot connection through activities in Concord, in Maine, and beyond. It was a pleasure to receive James's email reply to my first communication regarding Penobscot Nation membership in the Thorough Society. He began auspiciously, fellow Thoreauvian. Increasingly prominent in the Thorough canon 
the Maine woods is now regarded by many as second only to Walden in importance. Thoreau's abiding interest in Native Americans manifested in arrowheads gleaned from field walks and 10 Indian notebooks gleaned from voracious reading endured till his final days and deathbed utterance, moose and Indian. These words allude almost certainly to his formative main experiences with his wilderness icon Moose and his Penobscot guides, Joseph Addian and Joseph Paulus, both call Joe in the book. Addian and Paulus lived on Indian Island in the Penobscot River, close to Old Town where legendary canoes are still made, upriver from Bangor and its modern giant lumberjack statue on the edge of what was in Thoreau's day a significantly logged forest, but in his view, an essentially wild Maine woods. Today, though less logged for economic reasons and less wild due to tourism and encroaching development, the diminished but still massive woods continue to provide what Thoreau went there for and what many visitors go for now. In his words, a wilder experience than the town affords. On his first Maine Woods trip in 1846, Thoreau climbed Mount Katahdin, the Algonquian greatest mountain, defined by him as highest land, where the tracks of moose transcended the marks of man. And the Penobscot god Pomola is always angry with men who trespass on the sacred mountaintop. Also recorded in his Katahdin account is Thoreau's first frustrating attempt to hire an Indian guide. On his second try in 1853 and recounted in Chesuncook, he fared better with Joe Addian, who did the job expected but struck him as somewhat less Indian than hoped for in demeanor and skills. Thoreau underestimated Addian, regarded highly by both Penobscots who made him their chief and the Yankee loggers with whom he often worked. A leader on a logging crew, Addian died a hero trying to save men in a spring river drive accident. Finally, on his 1857 Allagash and East Branch excursion, Thoreau found his own Penobscot hero in Joe Polis a guide in every sense, whose mark was a bear paddling a canoe and whose skill navigating two cultures made him a tribal spokesman in Augusta, Maine, Boston, and Washington, D.C. Historian James Francis told the annual gathering audience that Thoreau came to Maine with the idealized noble savage in mind, but found something else. Indeed, over three trips and a dozen years, encounters with the living Penobscot nation confounded and enriched Thoreau's thinking about Native Americans and their shared new, and I'm putting that in quotes, new world. Thoreau records that early in his last main excursion, I told Joe that in this voyage, I would tell him all I knew and he should tell me all he knew to which he readily agreed. All is a lot to ask, but clearly some of Joe Polis did rub off on Thoreau, leaving him and his readers better for the experience. Presumably Joe himself got more than money from his exchanges with Henry. In any event, a closer relationship between the Thoreau Society and the Penobscot Nation has precedent and promise for all concerned. So to update that, welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So for our audience, uh, the idea of working on a webinar with the Penobscot people 
We, um, we discussed this at our board meeting, Ron, back in early April. And I think it was you that suggested that um, they might do a um, tour of Indian Island for us or some form of video. And then I learned just the other day when uh, James and I spoke on the phone, um, just how quickly this film was put together, um, really over a period of three to four weeks. And I'd like James to um, talk a little bit about, um, just in terms of giving us, before we jump into the details of the film, sort of an overview of the undertaking of, of the film and the flight and the um, significance of the east and west branches of the Penobscot River in terms of framing the um, film for us, as well as, of course, um, the Maine woods, which it, which it forms its boundaries. James? Thank you, Mike. And, and thank you, Ron, for those, uh, those words that were um, fantastic. Um, for me, there is no better way to tell the tribe's history than from a river perspective. And so I had gotten a message um, from Brian Wenzel um, that he was, uh, had gone on a flight and he was itching to go on another one. And I uh, coerced him to fly up the river and um, he shot this great video of the river that um, I really wanted to use every every inch of it. Um, we used more than half of it because we <clears throat> we flew up the river and then back down the river. Uh, what you see in the film is uh, you know traveling up the river, uh, which is really appropriate for the place names because often, um, as mentioned in the film, they uh, make more sense from an upriver traveling perspective. Um, usually not at a thousand feet, but um, so everything seemed to just fall into place um, to be to frame the the film with that aerial footage. Um, the community is kind of shut down in that um, we are not allowing visitors. There's signs at the bridge, and uh, the chief is really um, discouraged being out in the community. And so doing a community tour didn't make much sense because it would have felt like a ghost town um, rather than the, the vibrant community that we do have here. So um, framing the whole thing with the flight and, and, and as you can see at the end of the movie, I'm, I'm very grateful to Brian uh, for, for doing that for us. And um, it was good to see the, um, even from my perspective, the whole river from that vantage point and I've, I've paddled most of it. So it just makes sense to tell our history from a river perspective. And then the film opens with um, our hero, Henry David Thoreau, uh, showing up at um, Indian Island or in effect as um, a tourist, we see him with the sunglasses and he's making some comments about um, essentially, he's he's sort of shocked with what what he um, finds and um, equates the church with Rome and so on. Would you like to speak a little bit about the opening and and um, how how Thoreau is uh, portrayed at the beginning of the film? Yeah, I'll, I'll backside and woodshed. I think he says. Um, you know, this when I first read the Maine Woods many many years ago. Um, page six of my version is where this shows up. And it always struck me as, um, well, racist at first. And growing up in this community, no one had uh, very good words to say about Thoreau. And as I learned more about Thoreau, um, and, and Ron alluded to this about the noble, noble savage, he came here looking for what he looked for his whole life, relics. He was just looking for relics and people. He was looking for, um, you know, people who were untouched by civilization. And by that time in the mid 1800s, we were quite assimilated. Um, we were still living um, 
a woodland existence in, in some aspects uh, through guiding, but uh, for the most part, we were quite assimilated. So um, he was quite disappointed in what he saw. Um, and I wanted to um, start there. And I felt it was, was appropriate. And then it kind of morphs into uh, a modern view of Indian Island that I went and shot from the same place that most of those older pictures come from. You get an understanding of what that very historic and popular view of Indian Island looks like today with the bridge and um, the trees are back. Um, and, um, and also Henry putting his mask on because uh, as we all have to these days. I was struck by, uh, it was a learning experience for me to see how closely the Penobscot Nation works in cooperation with the state of Maine and with the national park system and just how extensive the, the, re the reservation is. And so at the beginning of the film, um, you focus on the life and the, her the heroic life of Joseph Atien. And you also um, rely on the work of um, Fanny Ekstrom to tell that story. Uh, could you open that up a little bit for us? Um, yeah, um, there's that book, um, Penobscot Man by Fanny Hardy Eckstorm, which came out about the same time as Frank Speck's Penobscot Man. In fact, this correspondence between the two, uh, he was quite upset that she was naming her book, essentially the same thing he named his book. Um, but it really looks at, um, you know, the, the West Branch of the Penobscot Log Drives, and it's a book about death. Each chapter is is a tragic story. And um, most of those stories have to do with uh, Penobscot men, but not all. Um, the Penobscot men she's talking about are those, those log drivers. And she's often chastised within the annals of history because of the way she collected her stories. Her father, Manly Hardy, was a, um, a fur trader and he, he had a um, company a lot at the house. Uh, old John Neptune used to come and visit him. They actually lived in Brewer down back behind um, the Hardy's house um, and would come to the house and share stories and trade furs and um, Fanny was collecting those stories. She also did extensive work on place names which uh, is invaluable to our work um, kind of exploring the landscape from uh, from a um, vantage point of our ancestors. And then it was uh, f fascinating too to get the sort of Joseph Adian as a watershed where he's the last of the ancestral chiefs and the first governor that he um, actually won an election and became the first governor of the Penobscot Nation. Yeah, that, that causes a huge rift in our in our um, political system, and we had old party, new party politics for many, many years after that. But I really felt it was important to tell his story um, because often it gets glossed over. You know, the fact that he was Thoreau's guide gets some attention, um, but you know him as you know a a chief or a governor of the tribe, that gets a little more play, but his death seems to get glossed over. And I'm not sure if it's because of uh, Fanny's reputation in, in the, you know, the scholarship of history or, um, but it just seems to always fall short. And I really wanted to spend some time and explore myself. You know, I had never been to that part of the river and in two days, I saw it twice in two different ways. You know, there was plenty of water when we went there flying over it. Um, cascades of water flowing over the last pitch. And then we hiked in the next day to um, essentially a bone dry riverbed. And it was amazing um, to see that. And then as I explored further about that part of the river, I realized that um, because of um, you know, the paper mill industry, the river got diverted. And so today that portion of river essentially 
has what we call in our culture a frog monster on it that's gobbling up all the water. Uh, we have a story of how this frog stopped the flow of water in the river and uh, it's often associated with dams. But it's, um, you know, to me it was really um, important to look at the landscape of this area where he died and kind of explore what, what, what happened, not only to him on that day, but explain what happened to me between two days and the levels of the water. I thought that was very powerful and it connected the past and the present. And the question I had about it was what happened? I understand they have the diversion of the water. Did it get diverted overnight or something and that, that drained that area? Because you have water one day and then the very next day not. Yeah, so they, were, they probably had a release at the dam to okay. let water go down. Yeah. that four mile channel, um, you know, the day we flew over it, but the next day it was, there was no flowing uh, at all. It was just this small ribbons of water going over the, that last pitch where from the, from the air, there was a uh, quite a white torrent going over it. Hmm. I that thought, you, I thought using the river as the connective, you know, image, in the in the film really works because it, it it pulls everything together in the Penobscot territory, the Penobscot experience, and the Penobscot history. I mean, it, it's like the river in Huckleberry Finn. It really does a lot of work for that film that you put together. It's a incredible and working in all the documentary, the photographs, and all and those, those kind of things was. Uh, I can't believe you were able to do it in that short amount of time. I can ask my wife. It was some long nights, um, uh, like five in a row to midnight, uh, twelve-hour days. Um, but I think you know, w without people's help, uh, Jennifer was instrumental in helping, and Jason uh, shot some footage, uh, and of course Brian and Chris and Charlie Brown. It was really a team effort, and um, I did bring on another editor named Josh. He helped out tremendously. So it wasn't just me, but, um, but thank you. Um, it, was, it was a labor of love. I really enjoyed uh, doing it. And uh, for me, uh, when, when, I, when I flew the river, I knew that that was it. That was going to be that thread that allowed. I didn't think I was going to do the whole from Indian Island to Nicotau. Um, you know, which is the fork, um, but um, that's that's how it happened. And that that Nicotown means fork, and it's um, it's it's defined as a fork of two equal weights. You know, that uh, it's a split in the river, a Y, but each leg of that has equal weight, um, and which tells you that you know the river essentially gets broken in two there. Um, and they're both important. The uh, East Branch going to the east into the north of Mount Katahdin and the West Branch going to the south into the west of the mountain. It cradles it. And, you know, for me, I've always thought about that sacred mountain and the water that flows off that mountain flows through the landscape and weaves in and out, creating the islands that we live on. And um, as it flows to the sea, that's um, always been a really powerful uh, connection between us and that mountain. It's that water that flows by us is that water that flew down, flowed down that mountain. So um, yeah, I wish we would have got to fly closer, uh, but I was just happy to be as close as we did get. It's remarkable how the um, the dams and the logging have defined the um, the river system in the Maine woods and over time. And I remember in the Maine woods, Thoreau talks about um, diverting one of the lakes or one of the ponds in order to, in, instead of having the log flow go north into Canada, where you would have to pay a toll, they diverted the entire log flow to go south 
um, not into Canada to avoid to avoid the toll, which I just thought was what a remarkable feat of engineering, but also what a um, just just the um, the human impact on on the main woods with with logging activity. But I wanted to um, try to um, get to some of the other panelists. I know um, Chris Suck Alexis is not. Uh, hasn't joined us this evening and he's uh, a big he's, part of he's on he's on he's just not on video oh he's not on video oh well um chris is a big part of the story because his um family's ancestral um hunting ground is at mount kineo and uh, mount kineo of course is a prominent um, feature of the main woods um it's on moosehead lake and a prominent part of the, um, the documentary, uh, but also in terms of legend and storytelling um, of, of how and where to find, um, is it rhyolite stone that is used for um, tool making? M maybe uh, Chris, if you're available, you can talk to us a little bit about that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, I'm on my phone. Yeah, so Mount Kineo is very interesting. It's a, a special rock. I mean, you see it in a lot of archaeological sites. Um, it's a fine grain volcanic rock and it, it, it flakes beautifully. So when I go and, so I'm a flint napper. So when I go up there and harvest the rock from the mountain, uh, you know, I look for specific rocks that really want to flake well. What were the different kinds of tools and points that they traditionally made from that? Well, with the Kineo, I mean, you can make some beautiful spearheads, uh, knife edges. I mean, it flakes very well, and it produces very sharp flakes. Like, when you flake it off, you get a very solid, you cut a steak with a rock. Hmm. Another part of the film, Chris, where um, I just was fascinated was with the Mattison Dam, and when that was... Um, when the water level on the river went down, you were able to find um, some archaeological sites at that point in the river. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for uh, the Mattisonk Dam, when they released the impoundment, they released it fully. And to go up in there and paddle the original state of the Penobscot River. I mean, the original river was amazing, but the archaeology was very cool. I mean, we we're walking on these, I guess, exposed terraces, and not just pre-contact, prehistory, but we're, we found some farmsteads on the original state of the river. It, it was crazy, you know. We're Archaeology is cool with the stones, but to find, you know, horseshoes and anchors and logging equipment was very, very cool as well. When did, when had it gotten flooded by the dam? How long had it been underwater? That I would have to look up. Not entirely sure when the dam was built, but it, it wasn't that long ago. And, and when the waters um, receded, it, it revealed, you said 6,000 years to present era worth of um, you know, archeological evidence. Yeah, yeah. Um, I came across some fire hearths with some tools around them. 
And it was, you know, we were looking at a double bit ads. So it's a stone tool, stone ads, which is like an ax today, modern day ax. Um, spearheads, arrowheads, and a lot of quartz, which is very cool. And, and Monsungan. Uh, we found this cache of uh, Monsungan flakes. No tools, but someone, our ancestors, put that right there. That's, that's what's important. Well, that's sort of a nice segue into um, the concept within the documentary of um, cultural revitalization, the uh, project that is underway or began. Um, and I remember, I remember visiting uh, Greenville, I forget the year, but it was the year that we, they put in the um, Thoreau Wabanaki Trail. And I had the pleasure of meeting um, Butch Phillips on that trip. And Butch is, um, figures into the documentary here for just a moment, but he, um, it's mentioned that he was um, making birch bark canoes. And I guess where I'd like to take this is, um, Ron, in 2014, you joined and other members of the Thoreau Society joined the um, Penobscot Nation for a trip that was covered by Yankee Magazine. And it's the largest photo spread that Yankee Ma Magazine ever did in their entire history of, of this trip that commemorates Thoreau's um, 1857 um, trip to the Maine woods. And um, the story was done by Mel Allen and um, the photography was done by little outdoor giants. And that's um, reproduced some in this film. And I, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit from, from Jason Pard Pardilla. You were on that trip and um, participated, um, I guess, um, talking about Webster Lake and then the paddle down to Lake Grand Matagammon, which is in the northern part of um, what today is Baxter State Park. Maybe you could talk about your experience um, on that canoe trip. Jason. Yeah, um, that part of the trip, paddling through Webster Stream with uh, several portages. And uh, I remember we were a little behind schedule because of the portages. So we had to try to make up time. So we had to push further and further. And by the time we finally got off the stream that had current, we were all tired and then to know we had to paddle across uh, a lake in order to meet, uh, reach our destination for the night. And I, I speak for myself, but I'm sure everybody else there was as tired as I was paddling that day. And to see the smoke at our campsite coming up across the lake and as we got close to hear Chris uh, singing a traditional song and drumming for us. Yeah, it was a very exciting uh, moment. Thanks, Jason. Ron, would you like to say something about uh, the trip? J just that the, the trip was done in, in stages and it involved a lot of travelers who were there for different lengths of time. I was just there for the first like two and a half days Jason was one of, I believe, eight people who did the whole thing. They, they, they ran the whole run of, of, for 16 days, which was uh, quite an accomplishment. And it, it must have been amazing to put that whole thing together and connect with uh, others, other Penobscots in your mind who have done that over the, over the centuries. Jason, can you tell us what is going on now with cultural tourism and specifically what you're working on at, at Sugar Island. I saw that was mentioned in the film. I thought it was really interesting because I've been on two trips now, that one in 2014 and then the one, uh, was it last year or the year before, you know, where uh, we, were, we were out there with Polly Mahoney. And that was, that was really great also. And I think that a lot of people, certainly a lot of Thoreauvians would be interested in doing that kind of thing. 
Yeah, uh, we have quite a lot going on uh, with uh, the Sugar Island part. We paddle from Pasadumke down to the island and we do several things uh, as far as cultural things. Uh, Jen does basket making and uh, plant identification on Sugar Island. And we have uh, guest artists from the tribe come up and uh, show uh, carvings or work with the birch bark canoes, which uh, sometimes part of the trip, we bring uh, a birch bark canoe that you can paddle. And uh, everybody seems to be very happy about that because I'm always happy when I get to paddle a birch bark canoe on the water. And uh, we keep on improving Sugar Island. For anybody that was with us on the first trip, it, there was, uh, it was fairly overgrown as compared to what it is now. There was just pretty much, you know, simple trails the, that first year when everybody from the trip was there. And uh, we've done some significant improvements that uh, ties in with the, the river trail. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So I'd like to get to Jennifer Neptune. Um, during the, um, that canoe trip along um, down to Lake, Grand Lake Matagammon, um, there's a scene from um, Brown Islands and, uh, and there's that beautiful shot of the uh, fiddleheads and um, Jennifer is talking about uh, ground nuts and tubers. And uh, I was, I'd like to hear more about collecting tubers and how they're used and a little bit about that. Sure. So um, the name in our language for them are Banucks and they're little, they're like little round potatoes almost. They're little tubers and they're connected by their root. So if you can start you know find the start and pull you can often pull up a chain of them that are all connected um they grow along riverbanks and streams sometimes on lakes and they're just a, like a really good um wild food um that's traditional for us to eat like fiddleheads and they're really tasty they're like little potatoes so they're good cooked in stews they're good sauteed my favorite way is with garlic and butter. Um, they're just really nutritious and yummy to eat. And they, they just grow like so abundant along the river. That was really nice when we landed there because the spring had kind of washed the bank away a little bit. And so they were exposed and super easy to collect. So we were able to collect enough to get a couple of feeds out of it for all of us. And in another place in the film, um, Jennifer, and I can see in, in your background, it looks like you're in your workshop and you're a master weaver. And you, you also uh, work at the Penobscot Nation Museum. And there's a scene where you're discussing the canoe uh, that maybe belongs to Joe Pullis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that canoe, um, we know it was built in the 1850s, just, you know, from the way that it was constructed. And we've had, um, like, Steve Kayard, who's an expert on birch bark canoes, come in and look at it. And he said, you know, um, Polis was one of the last ones to make them into you know, that way into the 1850s. So people were starting to switch to nails because they could make them faster. And he was like the holdout that wouldn't make the switch. And hmm. so that's a way of, um, you know, identifying makers and identifying the time period that things were made. Um, James did a lot of work researching and searching through Thoreau's notes, trying to find dimensions and um, see if it was the same dimensions as the ones that we knew that he was making at the time and it does match up and so while it's hard to know like 100% is that the canoe that they went in um, we know that it was one that you know more than likely was built by Joe Polis and we're really lucky to have it. <laughs> I, I think being able to describe that to Joe Polis is 
tremendous and particularly the detective work that you did to have some evidence to to back up that conclusion that's really cool it is <laughs> so we have um looks like we have 76 um participants here listening to us this evening and for um and I can get to you just in one moment, James. Um, for the audience, Thoreau had, um, on his second and third trip, his guides were Joseph Atien and Joe Polis. Um, James, would you like to say something? No, I was giving a thumbs up to the number of people here. Thank you all for coming. Great. Okay, well, I don't want to, um, I want to get to Brian Wenzel, who was the pilot, um, flying um, over the, the main woods and uh, just ab about, well, as we we're saying at the outset, how the river helps to tell the narrative and, and being able to capture um, Nakato Island right there where the East Branch and the West Branch of the, of the rivers come together and how that forms sort of a circle around the main woods, but also around um, Mount Katahdin, or rather Katahdin. I know it's redundant to say Mount Katahdin. Uh, so Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your experience as the pilot and working with these, with this group? Oh, Brian. <laughs> um, yeah, Michael, and just for context, I was on the, um, the 2014 Thoreau uh, Wabanaki trip with Ron and, and Jason, Jennifer and James, um, and played a small role, role in helping to organize it. And then was able, uh, I was on Moosehead and then the last night on Sugar Island. So I saw Sugar Island on that, um, when they mentioned it was overgrown and was able to go back to it on one of the cultural tourism trips last fall with my son, Eli, who's 10 years old. And so got to experience, it was sort of the full circle of going back there and seeing it um, in all its, I don't know, spiffiness and it's, it's really a, um, it's such a great combination of um, camping and comfort um, that the cultural tourism trips. Um, so I highly recommend them to anybody who does it. And, and you think about it, it's a, uh, it's just an entirely unique experience. There's no other place that you can have that experience where, um, you know, the Penobscot people have opened up generously to share their culture with, with us. And you know, that doesn't happen anywhere else really. So. It's a unique experience, but yeah, it was an honor to be able to fly James. And as, as I told, told him, um, and we connected it at his, uh, at a talk that he gave and, and we realized we both had an interest in aviation and I offered to fly him and, uh, and had the GoPro attached to the wing. Um, and as I told him, it was kind of, it was tough for me because I'm concentrating on flying the plane and he's telling me, uh, I'm glad to be able to watch the video because then I can really absorb what he was telling me in the plane about all the islands and what was happening. I, after the flight, I said, I'm sorry, James, I think I caught about 80% of what you're telling me because I was really concentrating on flying the plane. Um, but it, it really, what strikes you two things, you, when you're in the air and you just see the landscape, there are no town boundaries, no, there are no political boundaries. Um, you see the landscape for what it is and what it should be. Uh, and then the other thing you realize is Katahdin, um, you know, we all know it's much more than a pretty mountain, but uh, in, in all of its spirit, spiritual importance to the Wabanaki and the Penobscot, but, you know, you see it there, uh, especially on a clear day above the river, and you see it, it really looks like the source. You know, this is where the river is flowing from. Uh, you see it rising above the river. So that really also struck me um, with that flight. Yeah, that picks up on what James was saying about living where the water from Katahdin washes by your door. That's very nice. I first, um, I decided to take a, um, a seaplane out of Greenville one year and I was inspired by Ron Hogue, who I remember from a 1997 Thoreau Society trip to climb Katahdin that after our trip, Ron, you flew the main woods with, um, Brad Dean, I believe it was. And that just sound, sounded to me like a wonderful way to sort of take in everything that you can see from the mountaintops. And uh, it was really a wonderful 
experience to fly out of um, Greenville over Moosehead Lake. But I, I'd like to say a, I'd like to say a little bit about um, about um, Chris Francis, um, who we affectionately refer to as Charlie Brown. Um, he's not able to join us this evening, but um, James, you and uh, Chris did some work at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, looking at lithics that Thoreau had um, had collected over um, basically uh, during his adult life. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about your your work with um, Chris? And then maybe we'll move to some questions from the from the audience. Well, uh, it was actually Chris Sock Alexis who went to Peabody with me. Um, Chris Francis, Charlie Brown is um, our tribal hunter. He's uh, one of the most uh, successful and revered hunters in the community. He's also a longtime um, council member on our tribal council. He's currently sitting as a council member and um, he's probably, <clears throat> probably up to camp um, with his family uh this weekend um but it was me and chris sock alexis who um we actually went to the harvard peabody for the opening of uh birch bark canoe exhibit that we uh co-curated uh with them down there and um we went down there to open the exhibit with the small uh reception and then we stayed overnight but we took the opportunity before the reception to go into the collection and um, photograph um, Thoreau's lithic collection, which was um, quite extensive. And uh, we did it very quickly. I mean, we were probably in the scope of six hours, we photographed the entire collection. And the image that you see in the in the film of them all lined up in kind of um, decorative fashion. Uh, I put that together as a poster, uh, a very large poster that um, those stones are life size in the poster. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was, um, I didn't lay them out like that. I laid them out digitally from the digital photographs for that image. Um, so we didn't have time to get fancy like that. We just um, would take a picture of one side, flip it over, take the other side and move on to the next. Um, Chris would lay them down and I would take the pictures. And uh, Jennifer can, um, <laughs> I mean, she's currently digitizing the Penobscot Museum now, um, her and one of her workers. And it takes a long time. And um, you know, for us to do what we did in six hours. I'm sure, we don't have many records about what, what, what they are, um, short of they came from the Thoreau collection, but um, we have those images. And the, the quotation that you pulled out of his, uh, I guess it was his journal to, yeah. to go with that was, what a great fit. Yeah, um, at the bottom of that post, it was, uh, it's a lot longer. Um, for the film, I just, uh, I like that whole kind of imagery that he uses, um, not only calling them dragon's teeth, but he, he kind of um, calls them seeds. Yeah. Cast over the landscape and, and they, um, you know, they're stone fruit. So mm -hmm. I, I, I thought that was a uh, pretty powerful, um, you know, considering you know, our connection to, to seeds and the plants and uh, his uh, obsession with, um, with stones, relics. Um, it was um, very befitting. He was um, obsessed with them. He even knew, um, he knew if somebody was plowing their field in the fall that that's the first place he was gonna go to in the spring because the, the stones would have been turned up in the, in the uh, the spring freshets and the rains and the melting snow would have exposed them for him. And that's how he looked at it. They were, they were being exposed for him uh, to find. Um, so I thought it was very appropriate to um, talk about that within, within the film. And his, his comment about how they're inscribed into the land 
and how when he holds them, he connects with the maker of that particular uh, item is uh, really, really good stuff. It, it, it is, yes. And he, um, he gets very philosophical about that connection. And, and much like his, uh, you know, the connection between the wilderness and, and God and, and how that connection is there. Um, he does that with these um, lithics to to the maker of that stone because he really understood that somebody else touched this that stone it's just isn't just any stone it's a stone that somebody took the time to uh, flint nap and as you can see in the video of Chris flint napping um, you know that it's a um, you know it's quite a process and um, and he recognized that and um, and made each one of them special to him. And, and pairing that, that it, it, you know, you just linger over that flint napping process there as it's taking place and seeing that and then pairing it up with that, that quotation about Thoreau connecting with the maker, um, that's, that really links it together. Mm. James, it's also, a, um, it's also a very poetic part of the film where you have the time-lapse um, motion picture of the moonrise. And I, was that at the Mud Pond Carry where you were filming that? No, that's actually, that was on, on Sugar Island. That's actually me and Jason hanging out at the fire. Um, okay. That was, um, yeah, for as many seconds as you see that, that was, um, that was several hours. Uh, to shoot that um, it's uh, they're, they're not a uh, time lapses aren't a quick process at all um, and it's something I've been doing for for years um, you know a lot of pictures um, strung together uh, you know I burned through one very expensive camera doing it and now I'm on my second um, in fact I was shooting a time lapse of me writing Penobscot on the pond behind our house and I was on the phone with Jennifer and um, my, my camera threw, threw apart on the inside because it was just too tired. And she's, and she's like, something's wrong with your camera. And so I had to uh, come back up to the house and sure enough, it, was, it had a vein inside that was bouncing around and it messed up the, um, the whole inside of the camera, the, the sensor. But, Oh, Owen, can you say a word about your creative magic on coming up with a Thoreau's voice? As oh, God. Um, well, it's not, not so much creative magic as it is theft, I think. Um, I had an audio book of um, Thoreau and recorded it at high speed. And then um, once I was in Premiere Pro, slowed it down um, to try to get around any anybody recognizing uh, the person whose voice it was. Um, but it, it also, to me, it fit, it fit him. Um, um, just the way it came out, he, he seems very arrogant in, in that tone. And it seems to fit how I've always seen him as kind of um, this privileged uh, visitor to, to our homeland. And, um, so yeah, that's that's where that all came from. I, I, I thought the images of him with the with the you know the Foster Grant shades was uh, <laughs> just just perfect. And then at the end, when you're giving the credits and it's dot 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 and Henry, there's yeah. some really good humor in there. That 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 works. You got to know your audience, right? Yeah. <clears throat> We have a few more minutes, and I'd like to um, take some questions from the audience, which they have um, have used the chat feature to um, text their questions. So here's one. Uh, one person writes, I am very much interested in the ways that place names give meaning to the landscape, and as you said in the film, help us to see how the ancestors saw the landscape. Is there a glossary of Wabanaki place names in Maine. I live in Maine, have been to the Tribal Museum on Indian Island. 
Uh, there's no glossary, but um, at the Tribal Museum, there is a, a map. Uh, I talk about them briefly in the, in the film that we're on our uh, fourth or fifth generation. Um, so I started these, oh God, probably 20, 30 years ago. I started to document texts like Thoreau's Maine Woods and start putting down on the map where he's talking about and then cross-reference it with other things like Joseph Treat's journals. And uh, there's a myriad of other uh, sources out there. Um, Lucius Hubbard and uh, Greenleaf and um, took all of those and started making these maps. And uh, the most recent one, it really expands to include um, our portage routes into the adjacent uh, watersheds. So there is a map available. Um, I think you can reach it through the um, the tribal. Oh, go ahead, Jennifer. I put my email in the chat comments, and I'll put it one more time. Um, if you're interested in that map, you can email me, and we can figure out a way to get it to you. We have them at the museum, and I can I can ship them out. Thanks, Jennifer. And so tonight's webinar is being recorded. And when you go and if you view the recording, you can also view the chats as well. As well. So that will be a good way to um, go back and remember what's been discussed. So just a couple of comments from the audience about the film um, that I can read before we close. Um, so one person writes, I really appreciate how comprehensive the film is how you use aerial photography, artwork, maps, archeology, span and oral tradition to tell the story of the Penobscot and especially how it illustrates the larger range of Penobscot territory well beyond Indian Island. You basically remap the landscape from a Penobscot perspective. Question, are there issues or topics that you didn't cover but that you want to cover maybe in future films. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was uh, discussing this um, earlier with somebody, you know, particularly the, the Bamola piece. Um, I, I show a picture of what Andrew Dana, um, how he imagined Bamola to be, and I kind of juxtapose it against um, what Maury Stay did and made famous. Um, but I wanted to go into that story that Andrew told with that. Um, but in our culture, we don't tell stories um, unless it's during the winter moons. And that story in particular is, um, has never been published. Now the story of Glooskop and the Moose, which I um, tell during, during the story uh, after the time lapse of the moonrise, that's been published many times and it's kind of free game as far as telling that story. But anything that's not been published, um, I won't tell them outside of Winter Moons. And so there were, there were stories that I wanted to tell in this that I just couldn't. I, I, I brought it up, um, but I couldn't tell the story that Andrew told. So um, things like that. Um, there, um, every island that we got to, um, there was a story, whether it was, um, you know, Burnt Ground Island, which I just label, you know, there's this whole history of um, Native Americans burning uh, the landscape, especially in southern New England, where there was a, you know, hardwood forest. But here with the boreal forest, um, we would have burned the whole place down if we did that. But it was, um, you know, using fire as a forest management tool still happened here. You know, there's uh, proof that um, where the blueberry barrens are, Pineo Ridge, near Cherry Field, which is the blueberry capital of the world, um, there's proof in the sediments of lakes and ponds that Native Americans have been burning there for thousands of years using fire as a forest management tool. So um, 
you know, I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about the Mohawks, uh, our ancient enemies at Mohawk Island and Mohawk Rips. Um, it's just the list goes on and on, but the plane was flying too fast for me to get some of the stories out. Uh, you notice that I slowed it down from time to time to be able to talk about a certain place a little longer. But um, there was all kinds of stories up and down the river that um, I wanted to tell. Um, but there's only, it was only an hour and I tried really hard to be um, dedicated to that hour. But um, finally I gave in and called Ron and he gave me permission to let it eek over a little bit, which I appreciated. Nothing in it that I'd want to leave out. Um, are there um, members of the panel who would like to say some con concluding remarks? I would just want to say, um, if you didn't see my email, it's museum at penobscotnation.org or jennifer.neptune at penobscotnation.org. And I've been typing away all through this answering questions and it was only going to the panelists. So I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to quickly copy and paste so everybody can see the information I was trying to share. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'll see if I can capture some of some of that, Jennifer, to um, put it into the chat box. It may almost reproduce everything, but there it is. <laughs> Hopefully that's not too confusing. And maybe your comments now show up for everybody. So um, Ron, do you have anything you'd like to, to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is that when I suggested a possible movie to James, I imagined a, a two hour walk around the neighborhood with a video camera saying, and I think this is this, and this is this, and this is this. And in, instead we got, we got an epic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's, and I, I hope that you can uh, show it many times uh, to as appreciative audiences as you, as you had tonight. Well, one thing I do, I do want to add just as, as I, we, we close here, you know, with this, this COVID-19, our cultural tourism is, is taking a big, big hit this season. Um, we got clients dropping off the radar. And so we made a concerted effort to change how we're going to be offering trips uh, beginning the summer. And we've, um, we're going to a family model so that um, you know, a group of people who have been living with each other and um, can come on the trip. And we've um, developed a Thoreau specific um, journey, uh, especially for um, Thoreau Society. And um, you, can, you can contact us at um, james.francis at penobscotnation.org if you're interested in um, booking a trip to go to Sugar Island. Um, and learn a little more about our culture and get to paddle a birch bark canoe and um, have, a, have a lot of fun with um, everyone you see here, basically. Thank Thanks, you. James. So um, just to conclude, um, so uh, Thoreau, I don't know, it, or around age 28 um, in 1845, while he was living at Walden Pond made his first excursion to the main woods where he climbed um, Mount Katahdin, or Katahdin. And over, the, over time, he came to, um, we hope, mature in his attitudes and um, learned from each of his um, Penobscot guides, um, Joseph Adian and Joe Polis. And that um, today in 2020, we're able to keep that legacy between Thoreau and the Penobscot Nation alive and bring it before an audience and to encourage others to go to the Maine woods to have, um, to visit the land that Thoreau canoed and to um, experience a culture that's um, different from, from the mainstream. So thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to host all of you.
Um, the Thoreau Society webinars will continue tomorrow at noon with a second part two global conversation about Henry David Thoreau. And until then, um, I guess it's good night. I'm the executive director of the Thoreau Society. My name is Michael Frederick, and it's been a pleasure to um, host the audience. And this recording will be made available um, within a day. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.